Crockett, welcome to our community-based care webinar. Um, we're so excited to have you here and excited for the opportunity to um, provide just kind of a high-level overview of community-based care and um, hopefully answer any questions that you have um, and give you a sense of where we're at right now and where we're headed um, in our child welfare system in Texas. So joining me today is our um, esteemed boss, Andy Homer, who um, we wanted to say happy Bosses Day to. Happy Bosses Day. We love and appreciate um, him very much. And so I wanted to say happy Bosses Day to Andy. And then um, also you'll hear um, Ann Palmer, who's our Legislative Advocacy Coordinator um, here today. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I did want to let you know that um, we will be um, holding the answering of questions until the end. We will probably answer some of your questions as we go through the webinar. Um, and so, um, but as, as we're going through, if you have questions, type those into the chat box and we will be happy to answer those at the end if we haven't already answered them um, in, during the course of the webinar. So <clears throat> I think one of the things that we wanted to say at the outset was is that as we've looked at this, um, these big system-wide changes, as we've talked to our board and to our programs, one of the things that we've come to understand is that the process of change itself is something you need to understand as you're going through this and how to manage that and how people and organizations deal with change and how they process that. Um, we've got a very simplified version of that that you can see in the uh, first slide here that looks at how individuals and people process change. This is somewhat similar to how people actually deal with grief. And so normally there is an initial um, stage of uh, denial. Um, there's, you know, a resistance stage where people, um, you know, kind of can't accept things. Kind of down at the bottom, hopefully as you move along, you're able to um, begin to accept and explore. Um, and then, you know, hopefully you get to the final stage, which is, you know, a commitment uh, to the change and to making it align with the larger goals that you have. Um, so those aren't uh, necessarily a straightforward line that uh, people experience, and there are things that we will need to work with our programs to understand in terms of uh, making sure that people have voice, that their concerns are heard, and that they're able then to, as we progress, to, uh, you know, to be able to uh, get engaged and be involved. It's also very important to understand that um, we're not the only ones going through this change process and these steps. We should expect that courts, that um, our partners at CPS, as well as the uh, other participants in the child protection system, the SSCCs, you know, the big contractors, the child placing agencies who are out there, all of them would be dealing with the same thing. So we all need to uh, make sure that we understand how change works and that we, um, you know, work together to uh, move forward in the most productive sort of way. Great. So we wanted to start out by just giving you all a sense of why Texas has decided to move to the um, community-based care system and why the legislature um, is moving in this direction. And I wanted to also just say um, everyone who is registered for the webinar uh, should have received an early advanced copy of our new community-based care guide. And um, we will have that. Uh, we, that went out in our newsletter. It's on our website. We'll be sending out another email with that today. And in a few minutes, we'll share the link with you um, so you can access that full guide. So um, we'll be going into kind of high-level um, overview of the new system, um, but the guide really goes into detail about everything we'll be talking about today. And so we want, we'll be referencing that guide throughout, um, but we really encourage you to look at it and to read it and share it with others. Um, and then um, if you, after you have time to digest that new guide, 
um, feel free to send us any questions that you have as well. So one of the reasons that we've moved to community-based care um, was kind of the acknowledgement um, that we haven't been doing a great job in what's called the legacy system, which basically is our traditional child welfare system that we've had in Texas for a long time. Um, we haven't had great outcomes for children, and we haven't really done a great job with placement and other things. So uh, the legislature kind of looked at these issues, these kind of historical issues and challenges that we've had in the foster care system in Texas and wanted to move to community-based care to address some of those. So we're, we've laid out kind of the four main issues and reasons that the state wanted to move to community-based care. The first is that um, too many children are placed outside of their home communities. So uh, CASA is very familiar with that um, and has seen that um, issue for a long time. Um, but as you know, around 60% of children in foster care currently are placed outside of their county of origin, and around 22% are placed outside of their DFPS region. And that's generally uh, several hundred miles away. So the way that community-based care improves this is um, by creating an incentive for providers to keep children within a 50-mile radius of their home. Ideally, we would want the child to stay in their same county and even in their school of origin, um, but kind of acknowledging how big our state is and what's realistic given where we're at right now, um, we are moving to a 50 mile radius and that's the goal of community-based care and there are incentives for the providers um, to kind of use that metric. So that's kind of the first big issue that has been a really historical challenge for the child welfare system that community-based care um, means to address. The second really large issue that we have in Texas in the legacy system is that the state contracts for foster care, placement, and services haven't really been tied to a geographic area's needs. So we haven't really looked in communities and said, what are the needs of the children and families in this area, and um, can we incentivize providers to open facilities or foster homes that address the needs for that community? So it's been kind of an open enrollment process, and what that ends up looking like is that um, some parts of the state have a huge amount of foster homes or residential treatment centers, and other parts of the state um, have basically no emergency shelters, no residential treatment centers. One of the things that we looked at was that 47% of the residential treatment center beds in Texas are in Region 6 near Houston, which I think everyone is kind of familiar with. But the idea with community-based care is for communities to develop the services and the placement types that the kids coming out of those communities actually need. And so um, they set up a system that's a no eject, no reject model, which means that the community, the single source continuum contractor in that care, catchment area is responsible for serving all the children in that area. And again, with tied back to that 50 mile radius. So what we've seen in practice, what that looks like is there were no residential treatment center beds in Tarrant County, and now the single source continuum contractor has opened up two different residential treatment centers for the children that are in that community. So the idea is to really develop placement and services for kids that are in their communities and to do a better job of contracting for that. One of the other problems that we've seen historically is, is that the payment structures do not promote improved outcomes for children in care. And so that's the third issue that has been recognized. And basically, you know, we've had a level of care system that has four levels from basic to uh, moderate to uh, specialized to intensive, um, and so children um, were rated, and facilities and homes are paid based on those level of care. However, it does nothing to promote well-being and healing in children, um, or to try 
necessarily to keep children in more family-like settings, which is what we want. The basic way that uh, community-based care deals with that is through the payment structure for SS6Cs, which is a blended rate. They're paid basically um, kind of an average cost that um, accounts for the average acuity of kids in care. And what we have seen and what it was intended to do is to better align the payment structure with what we want to do in terms of children. So it, it tends to result in children more likely being placed in um, non-congregate facilities. It has also incented providers we've seen to, to develop a different types of capacity, particularly therapeutic foster care, which is either designed to keep kids out of um, RTCs and psychiatric facilities or to step them down from there and to get them back moving towards um, normalcy. The uh, next issue, uh, number four, is, is that we've had a system that historically has not uh, measured or really tried to incent um, children in, in the system to, um, to achieve particular outcomes. We have had permanent, permanency outcomes that were the goal of the system, um, but really not a whole lot of other things that um, you, know, you would want in the system in terms of well-being and other things. And so the community-based care model is almost entirely um, you know, based on um, measuring and achieving outcomes um, in specific ways. There's performance measures um, that are um, related to the goals of the system. Um, they measure those, and then over time, they will actually be uh, financially rewarded uh, or not for um, achieving those outcomes. The current system will be getting performance goals, but it's not likely that we'll have any um, financial incentives related to that for the time being. In, in addition to that, I wanted everybody to know that the legislature has actually made a very um, clear statement of the goals of community-based care. It's captured in the family code. Uh, in the guide, you can see on uh, page 39, it, it um, of the guide, or page 11 of the guide, it lists the goals, it lists the statutory reference. Um, and so I'm going to just walk quickly through the 12 goals that are listed um, in statute. And I also want us to realize that there are performance measures tied to most of these for the, the contractor. The performance measures, we're not going into great depth on them, but they're listed on page 39 in our guide as well. So the first one is just the safety of children and placements. They do have a measure on that. The second one is the placement of children in each child's home community. As Sarah referenced earlier, we do have a 50-mile um, um, radius around the child's um, home that we try and achieve, and they are measured um, on that. We also, the third one is provision of services in the least restrictive environment. That we do have a measurement on trying to have children in family-like settings. The fourth goal is minimal placement changes for children. We have a measure of placement stability that the contractors are held to. The fifth is the maintenance of contact between children and their families and other important persons. We have uh, measures around trying to keep or get kids into uh, kinship placements. Um, in addition, uh, the sixth is the placement of children with siblings. There's a measure on that. Uh, the seventh is provision of services that respect each child's culture. The eighth is preparation of children and youth uh, in care for adulthood, and we do have a measure that is uh, completion of PAL for uh, older youth who are uh, required to achieve, um, the, that are subject to going through the preparation for adult li uh, living uh, program. Uh, uh, number nine is the provision of opportunities, experiences, and activities for children in care that are available to kids not in care. This is normalcy. This has been a priority for CASA. They do have some um, performance measures related to that, both in terms of kids um, uh, having jobs, getting driver's license or other IDs. Um, I think they can still do work on this, but it's important that this is a goal. Uh, number 10 is participation by children and youth in making decisions about their lives. We do have a, they try and uh, measure whether or not children are attending court, court hearings and other things like that. And then the two most recent goals that they added were reunification of children with bio parents when possible, which is one of the you know, directives of Texas and federal law in any case. And then 12 is the promotion of placement of children with a relative or kin of reunification is not possible. We have you know, created a payment structure for kin providers 
Um, and there's lots of um, research that shows how beneficial it is to have children in a kinship placement if they can't stay with their um, family. So just so you understand that there is a big picture about this and it's tied to performance measures very specifically in most cases. We wanted now to move on to understanding the, one of the two big dimensions of community-based care, which is just the geography of how this is going to be procured and how it will roll out over time um, across Texas. As you can see from the, uh, the map, this is the map of the state of Texas with the different um, catchment areas that will be used for procurement um, in different colors here. Um, the system is based on the DFPS regions. There's 17 DFPS regions, so that's the largest that a catchment area can be currently. And then um, some of those are divided. So region three, which is the kind of pink, brown, and gray area up in the top middle is divided into three parts, as you can see. Uh, region seven, which is right in the middle, there's kind of a tan and then a light blue above that. That's uh, you know region seven. And the smallest area that you can have is a county. And so Bear County and Harris County are the only two catchment areas that are a single county. And that's, you know, Bear County is San Antonio and Harris County is um, Houston. The regions were designed so that there should be at least 500 kids coming into care per year. This is based on kind of a risk-bearing model to make sure that the blended rate works so you don't have very high-cost children who would um, cause financial problems for providers uh, in that. And um, I also wanted to say that our programs, we do have a, a map that overlays um, our programs with these catchment areas. That's on page 22. And there are 12 CASA programs that are divided between catchment areas and one program, Cross Timbers, is actually in three catchment areas. So please look at both of those maps both the catchment area map, so you understand that, and the overlay map um, on page 22. Okay, now we're going to start talking about the different stages of service, and these roll out over time. Um, so stage one, um, after a contract is awarded, uh, they're given a readiness period, it's usually about six months long, uh, to be prepared to take their first child. And after they've proven readiness, um, they begin to take uh, to provide foster care placements for children entering foster care. Um, they also provide the SSCC will also provide preparation for adult living services and daycare and adoption services. They're going to share that case coordination responsibility with CPS in this first stage. And uh, you'll note that we provide. The SSCC will provide foster care placement services in this first stage. They will not be providing kinship care services yet. Um, as with all of the stages of service, the goals for this stage are to start keeping children closer to home to build that local capacity and to improve the well-being of children in care. Okay, so um, stage two is the, the stage that I think kind of gives everybody the, the heartburn um, and the, the worry about community-based care. And this is the biggest change. So what Anne talked about in stage one is really part of the um, kind of the foster care redesign, the older model. So that's been going for quite a while. And um, the big change um, is really the stage two, where the single source continuum contractor will take over all of case management. So that means that there will no longer be a CPS caseworker that works for the state um, doing case management for children and families. So what are we talking about when we say case management? That's everything from um, showing up in court, writing court reports, um, being um, there to do the child and family plans of service, working with biological parents on reunification, providing kinship services. So right now in stage one, 
Um, the single source continuum contractor is responsible for placement, but only of um, children in licensed foster homes and licensed placements. So for kinship families, the Department of Family and Protective Services is still working with those families and uh, managing those placements. But in stage two, kinship services will go over, as well as reunification services. So essentially everything that CASA has traditionally um, partnered with CPS on, um, from getting to know the foster parent, showing up in school, doing educational services, everything like that, that now will be the responsibility of a case manager with the single source continuum contractor. And CPS will move into more of an oversight role um, that essentially to ensure that the um, SSCC provider, the case manager of um, the child is doing everything they're supposed to. So the focus of stage two is to expand the continuum of services, supports, and resources for families. So similar to what we've seen in stage one where um, the providers have really come up with innovative ways to serve children and they've expanded therapeutic foster care and other kinds of services for children, uh, the goal with community-based care is for those providers to also expand services for, for parents and families and things like substance abuse services, domestic violence services, those kinds of services um, for families within their community as well. And then to improve the permanency outcomes for children in foster care. And just to note, we will be discussing the, the rollout and where we're at on all of these um, issues a little bit later in the presentation. Um, and then finally, stage three, um, which is quite a bit down the road. So um, the timeline for um, between the time between when stage one starts in an area and stage two starts is around 18 months. And then we're expecting it'll be around 18 months as well for the provider to be able to move from stage two to stage three. And so no providers right now are in the process of moving to stage three, um, but essentially what this will be is um, putting some financial incentives and remedies in place um, depending on what they ultimately decide that the permanency outcomes for children in foster care, what those goals um, will be for a catchment area. Um, and essentially what we've heard so far, and this hasn't been officially defined, but it's that the state will um, financially incentivize the single source continuum contractors to reduce an individual uh, child's time in foster care. So that's what the financial uh, incentives and remedies will be tied to when a provider gets to stage three. So one of the big questions that we always get is, you know, how are we going to know if this is working? And it is a very different structure than what we currently have. So um, what we will see is that there are measures of accounti accountability and process built into the system. One is, is that the department and the contractor goes through a community engagement process. We do have uh, some detail on that, um, who should be included in that, and that should be in each of the catchment areas when a new contractor comes in. And in addition, the department um, requires the entity to show that they're ready to begin performing before they go live with that. Um, that has been, you know, fairly easy in stage one, but it's going to be a much more rigorous uh, kind of process to make sure that they are ready to proceed in stage two. And I know we had a question about whether or not there are any providers in stage two delivery. There are not right now. We are expecting a contract to be signed in region 3B, which is Tarrant County, Fort Worth, and six adjoining counties um, fairly soon is what we've been told, but we won't know until it is signed. Um, in addition to the readiness review and community engagement process, there's, you know, as we talked about earlier, a series of uh, performance uh, measures. Um, we referenced those. Those are um, on page 39 of the guide. Please look at those, and if you have questions, let us know. 
And finally, you know, there are a whole series of other transparency and accountability measures that are um, in place. Um, foremost of those is that the SSCC is standing in the state, the state shoe when they perform um, these efforts, and they are required to obey judicial orders. They're required to comply with state and federal law. There's a whole series of contractual provisions that they have to comply with, and they're subject to other state laws uh, like the Public Information Act and things like that. So, um, but it's important to understand that the SSC will essentially be acting in the state's capacity in a lot of ways, standing in their shoes. They do have a different relationship because they're not technically a party to the suit, but they, through contractual obligations, they are required to obey judicial orders and also to comply with state uh, and federal law. Okay, so let's talk about how this is going to roll out. Um, the short answer is slowly. It is rolling out at a stately pace, um, which is really just to say carefully. Um, the, what we're going to have in December, we're anticipating a report from DSPS that will say where they're intending to go next. And they're going to need to do that because they need to start talking to the legislature about how to fund that. So nothing is going to happen until we go through another legislative cycle. Nothing that hasn't already been funded is going to happen until we go through another legislative cycle. The legislature signs off on where they're going next and provides the funding to do that. Um, I, they will probably be making suggestions in that report and, um, based on, uh, they've said, proximity to existing uh, catchment areas that are, already have contracts. Again, five, they need to have at least 500 entries into CARE, and they need to show that they're ready as a catchment area, as a region, to, uh, to accept that rollout, to, to bring on uh, community-based care. So we'll be looking for that December report, and then we'll be looking uh, at the hearings, watching those hearings during session to figure out what the legislature plans to fund. On the next slide, we've got the timeline of what has already happened or what has been funded by the 86th legislature. Um, all of those providers up there have websites that we would encourage you to look at if they're in your region, um, that they explain their philosophy, they um, talk about their leadership, they talk about their goals for community-based care, so uh, we do recommend you take a look. We are waiting on the contract to be announced uh, for Region 8B. We expect that that delay has been while well, they've been looking for a commissioner. Now that they've got a commissioner, we're hoping they'll get back on track with announcing um, the contractor in uh, AB. Um, what else are we going to say about that? I can be part of the okay. So uh, also on the slide, you see that. Um, we were expecting um, stage two for um, region 3B with our community, our kids, to go live on March 1st, um, which means with that six-month um, startup, they, we were expecting that that contract would have been signed on September 1st of this year. Um, however, they've still not signed the contract for stage two up there. So we're expecting that that will be a, a month or two behind um, what we've got up there. So this, all of these dates and timelines are based on the funding um, that was funded from the 86th legislature, like Ann said. And then in addition to that, um, the timeline is based on um, when they started, when their contract was rewarded, and when they started. We are, we were just in a meeting last week with St. Francis Ministries and they are expecting to go live in January. So that anticipated date, it looks like we'll be on track up there for Region 1. And then again, we'll know in December where the department wants to go next. That will, of course, be subject to legislative funding, which won't occur at really until, uh, you know, the end of the legislative session in 2021. So. Um, all of you folks out there have times to, time to understand and prepare for all this. And to get involved. Speaking of getting involved, we wanted to talk um, about CASA's crucial role in um, the success of community-based care. Um, and as Andy talked about earlier on, we want to acknowledge and recognize that this is a huge change that we didn't necessarily ask for. 
Um, and so we know that there are a variety of feelings out in our network about this change. Um, and all of those feelings are appropriate and reasonable. Um, but, you know, our message really is that we, regardless of how we're feeling, um, we are an essential part of the child welfare system in Texas, and we play a crucial role in the lives of the children in foster care. And so it's really important for us to be at the table with the potential single source continuum contractors and in any of the planning that goes forward. So on page 28 of your uh, of the community-based care guide, we really go into detail about what CASA's role in community-based care will be. Um, it's really important to note that nothing about our legal role is changing. We will still be appointed by the court to represent the best interests of children in the child welfare system, and we will continue to um, represent the CASA network at the Capitol. So none of that, our, none of our legal role is changing, but who we work with is changing. And some of the policies and procedures in your communities and the way that the single source continuum contractor decides to meet the statutory requirements of the Department of Family and Protective Services is going to change as well. So it is so crucial for us to be a leader in these conversations, for us to engage in the process, for us to partner with the single source continuum contractors as they plan for uh, how this will look in your community, um, to collaborate with the judiciary, with the attorneys, with the single source continuum contractor and other providers in your area, um, and to come to the table with innovative ideas about um, what needs to happen in your community, what's working well, what's not working well, and what are the solutions. Um, in a meeting that we had uh, last week, we learned that there are planning initiatives of some kind happening in every region of the state right now, with the exception of regions four and five. And I know that many of our CASA programs have been involved in those conversations and in those planning initiatives. Um, but for those that haven't, we cannot encourage you enough to be at the table, regardless of how you feel about community-based care. Um, it's coming to your community, and it's so important for our voice to be represented in those conversations. Um, I just wanted to give one example of um, leadership um, in this area, uh, we had a conversation with our Lubbock program. They let us know that there was going to be a community conversation um, in their area about community-based care, and the single source continuum contractor had not been invited to that meeting, um, in part because the community was very nervous about what this might look like, um, and so wanted to kind of have an offline conversation. But the CASA program in Lubbock recognized how important it is for us to be at the table with these providers and to bring them into these conversations and actually proactively reached out to St. Francis Ministries and invited them to that meeting. And um, I met St. Francis uh, Ministries last week and they had great things to say about our programs up in Region 1. Um, and they were very grateful because they were able to explain to the community what their plan is and be part of that conversation. And that was a really crucial um, thing. So those are the kinds of examples of leadership and partnership and collaboration that we're looking for from our network um, and just excited um, to be part of the process and what this could mean for children and families. I also just wanted to say that um, we didn't go through all the details in this. We didn't get into any depth about the uh, funding that is associated with this. I've been warned that I can't talk about it publicly. <laughs> um, and we are very frank in this document, too, in looking at the strengths and the weaknesses as we see this, where we think this is going to improve outcomes in areas where we have concerns. So I think that's important for you all to look at that. We definitely want to have a balanced understanding of this. We also are learning from the folks who are working in areas with community-based care now, and we are open to coming back to you with whatever additional information that you need. We need to hear from you on that, so please 
Um, as a follow-up to this, if there are things you don't understand, if you think there are particular issue areas we need to talk about, um, let us know. And then Sarah is going to talk also about our upcoming efforts to do uh, some trainings around the state on this and a few other subjects. Yeah, so um, as we mentioned, we wanted to keep this um, webinar really high level and just give you a sense of what community-based care is, what it looks like, uh, why the state decided to move in this direction. Um, but it's really important to us to, as Andy said, to hear directly from you and to um, help everyone prepare within their communities and in their regions for this big change. And we know that some of our uh, regions in Texas are, have already got contracts and they've already um, started in stage one and then others um, have no idea when this might be coming to, this, to their area. So wherever you're at in terms of implementation and things, um, we are wanting to talk with you and make sure that we're doing everything at Texas CASA that we can to both hear from you, but also to support you as um, community-based care rolls out. So we will be um, going on the road, doing our little traveling road show. And uh, we start that um, in less than a month in the southern region Corpus. and uh, in Corpus. And then we'll be going um, around the state through the end of April. And so um, if you are interested in participating in these trainings, uh, we encourage you to reach out to your regional representative um, and ask to be uh, in attendance. We um, will have kind of limited capacity for some of these trainings depending on the location and the interest, um, but want to be accommodating uh, to you, to our network. Um, as much as possible. So if you're really interested in having more of a dialogue around community-based care and being able to kind of hear from your peers about what they're experiencing, uh, we encourage you to reach out to the regional reps on, on the board for each of these regions um, and ask to be a participant in those trainings. And so we wanted to um, give some time for you to ask us some questions, um, if you have those. And as Andy said, um, we will be um, accepting questions at any time. So if you have questions later today that you think of, or if you have questions in six months from now, um, we are here for you as a resource. And we want to um, answer any questions that you have and also elevate any concerns that you have as well. We are at the table for these conversations. We uh, understand um, that this you know, may have some risk associated with it. We know that the transition um, in certain areas has been really pretty bumpy. Um, and so we're able to kind of keep an eye at the state level what's going on and um, help to make connections or elevate issues um, if that's necessary. So I want to give everyone a time um, to type their questions into the chat box. Um, and also, again, just encourage you to um, review the community-based care guide that we've put out. Um, we will be bringing hard copies of that to all those regional trainings that we attend. Um, and then it will be on our website as well. And once we have more information um, after next legislative session, it is our plan to update this guide with uh, more information about Stage 2, um, where it's, how it's going, what are the risks and um, pain points in the Stage 2, what are the lessons learned. Um, so we plan to kind of continuously update this guide so that it's uh, a really useful resource for you now and also in the future. Um, so yeah, well, it doesn't look like anyone has any questions. Um, again, oh, will we be signing? We did get one question. Will we be signing an MOU with the SSCC? So that is a great question. We have been in communication with all of the current SSCCs, and it is our plan to have uh, an a standardized MOU that we're using in each 
uh, catchment area that will be specific to a uh, single source continuum contractor. And it will probably look a lot like the MOU that we have with the Department of Family and Protective Services, um, but really will be specific to community-based care. So yes, that's in the works, and that's something that Texas CASA recognizes as a priority for the network, and we've been trying to um, make that happen. And we have another question. It appears that it has been difficult for the community care provider to incorporate the role of CASA into this program. The Texas Family Code and judges do support our role. So I'm not sure uh, where this person is at in the state, um, but there have been some, um, depending on where you're at and which uh, catchment area and which SSCC that you're working with, um, there have been some issues with the transition. And, and part of that, um, in some areas, has been that they haven't been as collaborative with CASA in some areas as others, but that I think is getting better. But those are the kinds of things that um, we need to hear from you so that we can um, work with the SSCC and help you facilitate that relationship with the SSCC in your area um, and make sure that we um, know about those issues and that we're uh, troubleshooting them alongside you. And I think that's uh, most of what we had to present today. If there are any final questions, please get them in um, right away. We hope this is a good resource for you all. Please do bookmark it. Feel free to print it out. We'll, um, we, we don't like to waste paper, but I think this is a good source of information. We will be, I believe, sending two printed copies to each of the program as our um, plan right now. And um, as Sarah said, you know, please reach us at publicpolicy at texascasa.org with any follow-up questions. Um, and, you know, we will look at some of these things. There are, you know, outstanding issues about trying to make sure that we have a more st a standardized MOU that um, programs can enter into with SSCCs. And then if there are failures of SSCCs to um, work with CASA, we really need to hear that, so feel free to, to reach us out and, and notify us about that. We have heard some um, complaints about that. And we do have one question. So it, it is, um, are we part of CASA or an SSCC? So Texas CASA is the statewide membership organization for all of the 72 local CASA programs. So we are a, a part of CASA. And um, we represent CASA when we're talking with the SSCCs in each catchment area, and with providers, and with the state. So we, we represent the, the CASA network at the statewide level and um, depend on our local programs for collaboration. But we are a part of uh, the CASA network. No. So um, one person said that costs, did I hear you say that CASA will no longer be going into schools to talk to teachers, et cetera? No. So what I said was that CASA's role is not changing at all. From a legal perspective, we'll still be appointed by the court to represent the best interests of children and families. And our role will be exactly the same. So we will be able to go into schools to talk to teachers. We'll be able to talk to foster parents. Um, we'll be able to do everything that we can currently do now, um, but we will have a different partner. So um, the, the CPS caseworker will no longer be a part of the system in, after stage two begins. So there won't be a caseworker, and that may be where you were getting confused. Um, CASA will still be playing the same role, but there will be a caseworker from the single source continuum contractor, not from the Department of Family and Protective Services, who is in the role of the CPS caseworker. Well, I think that's most everything. Um, we we're hoping to get in in around 45 minutes, and we're right at that in terms of this. So um, please.